My book, The Art and Making of Fantasy Miniatures, is available now. Check out the link in the description to find out more. The Crafting of Narnia was published in 2008, and its subtitle, The Art, Creatures, and Weapons of Weta Workshop, is a good descriptor of the contents. That is, it's a showcase of the design work Weta Workshop did for the first two Narnia movies. There is a noteworthy amount on the physical crafts, the manufacture of the weapons and armor, but the vast majority is about the concept and design artworks. As with many of the books for the projects they work on, this book was created in-house by Weta and their team members, and then published via HarperCollins. So probably the most disappointing thing about this book is the fact that it combines two movies into one book, which is almost never ever satisfying, and this book does suffer for that little bit. I do really like how both movies are treated separately, rather than jumbling everything together. There is a clear division, which is great, but it's not an even one. So The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe gets 200 pages, and that's fantastic. It feels like you're getting a whole proper book for that movie. Prince Caspian, however, gets half that at only 100 pages, and half of those pages are just on Telmarine weapons and armor. Absolutely brilliant stuff, just very disproportionate and clear that the Caspian section is much weaker. Not only having half as many pages, but also noticeably fewer images per page compared to the first movie, and so it feels, if not exactly tacked on, at least that it's not a robust enough showcase to stand on its own, and so it proves the annoyance of combining two movies into one book, because you can either view it as a disservice to Caspian by being shortchanged with a comparatively meager offering, or you can view it as a disservice to Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because now you've got a 100 page section on Caspian that's dissatisfying anyway that could have been used to include some more very important stuff from the first movie that is absent. I'll talk more about that later. So yeah, I feel like they shot themselves in the foot by doing one book of this size. However, having said that, it's not as bad as I would have thought. In the hands of lesser creators, this could have been a seriously damning failure. Thankfully, however, the book does a lot of really good things to help render all this down to just a mild disappointment. So I think they've done fairly close to as best they could have in combining two movies in one book, but I'm not sure if that's actually worth admiration since it's just trying to make the best of a self-inflicted no-win scenario. But in terms of those things the book is doing well, having a 300 page count is really good, but even more importantly it's 300 mostly very well used pages. So even though it may not feel like the book contains two whole movies worth of content, it still definitely feels like you're getting 300 pages worth of content, which is a rare and wonderful thing for an art book to actually provide and basically one of the two things responsible for ultimately making a success out of what could have easily been a failure. And this is done via some pretty great layout which has prioritized including a greater number of more appropriately sized images as opposed to the ridiculous plague affecting 90% of art books that suffer a dearth of content due to unnecessarily gigantic images. Granted, the sizing and layout is not perfect here. As I mentioned, it slacks off noticeably in the section on the second movie with fewer images per page compared to the first movie's section, and even throughout the whole book there are some really bizarre and frustrating instances of like an entire page being dedicated to two drawings of a dagger, meanwhile several epic battle paintings are reproduced at thumbnail size. But overall, I guess in a world where the vast majority of books are laid out so ridiculously it boggles the mind, it's just a rare breath of fresh air to see a book whose layout is at least intelligent 75% of the time. Likewise, no blank space in here either. The other thing that's responsible for making the book so successful and easily its most consistently impressive and well handled aspect is the outstanding curation of what images it chooses to display. Specifically, the heavy emphasis on design exploration, early, alternate, and even cut designs, whole pages on creatures who never made it into the movies. Except for Star Wars, I can't think of any other art books that feature so much work showing exploration of designs and stuff actually looking different to what you see on screen. Granted, there are also tons of final designs featured, but done in a way that makes sense, shown for a reason and not done at the expense of the other stuff. But yeah, the primary focus on design exploration in this book is just so awesome, so much more fascinating to pour over, and I cannot understand why it's so rare for art books to do this. However, there is one hugely disappointing missing piece with the curation, the biggest letdown of this book in fact, and that is this is not truly the art of Narnia because of its limited scope on only including works produced by Weta, which is a problem because before Weta was brought onto the movie, production already had an art department creating concept art, including artists like Alan Lee, John Howe, and most importantly, Justin Sweet, who, for both movies, produced some of the most stunning concept art I've ever seen, yet none of it's in here. 
Ditto, even though there's a lot of costuming in here as it relates to armor, there was also a separate costume department that produced their own art that's entirely absent here too. And I get why, the book's supposed to be on Weta's work, but it just seems like such a weird, contrived division to say, well, these people weren't working at our company, so technically their work doesn't fall under the scope of the book, rather than looking at it as, we're all working together on the same project and it's still a part of the work Weta did. It's weird when the text talks about how much collaboration there was with the other departments that were producing art and design works, and you know, it'll say something like, this design is a refinement of a concept by John Howe, yet we don't get to see that in a book that, as I've said, has its major focus and strongest aspect being on design exploration and development, yet the earliest works that inspired it are completely absent. Though I am glad that at least the text acknowledges that work done by the people, which is nice, revealing, and I guess better than nothing. Ultimately, I suspect the decision for having such a narrow curation and not including those artworks is because of only having one book and so not enough space. Now, in a sense, I really respect the idea of the book having a limited scope in order to try and do a more more satisfying job by just focusing on one area, Wedder's work, rather than what most books do, which is to spread themselves too thin in attempting on satisfying coverage of everything. But even so, in this case, it's doing more harm than good, and it's still unsatisfying because one, again, this decision to have two movies in one book is a completely self-inflicted handicap, and two, it's a glaring, egregious omission that severely weakens the potential visual and conceptual appeal of a film's art book that doesn't include the film's best art and foundational artworks. It's pretty depressing to look up Caspian art online and see what could have been included had they instead chose to do two books and expand the concept to include those artworks. Thankfully, quite a few of those Justin Sweet artworks and some of the costume department's art are presented in the two movie companions which I have reviewed, although even though it's nice they're available somewhere, there's not enough to make it worth buying either of those books just for the art. The Prince Caspian one has like half a dozen artworks, including some from this book. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe companion isn't that much better in terms of quantity, but if you are a fan and a going to get that book anyway, it's really nice that there's little to no overlap in the images from that book in this Crafting of Narnia. Speaking of the companion books, even though each of them has a much higher word count than this book, the amount of behind the scenes information this one contains is far greater than both of them put together. Obviously only as it relates to the book's area of focus, but my point is it's got noticeably better writing and information than the companion books. Though that's not really saying much, and more of a criticism of those books than it is a compliment of this one. Because even though there is a decent amount of text in here for an art book, it is an unimpressively and frustratingly mixed bag. 40% of the time it is extremely well handled and intelligently written, offering truly insightful and interesting behind the scenes information and details that enhance the images. But then there's the 60% of the time where that's not at all the case. And that ranges from stuff that is just an inane waste of words, but more than that is the amount of text that tends towards, you know, maybe not being technically bad or completely worthless, but is so shallow and weak and just not at all optimized that it's unimpressive in a book with such a short word count, yet so much needing to be said, yet also displays evidence of a writer who is capable of more. The quality of the text fluctuates so wildly and relentlessly, it feels like being stuck behind someone who's constantly shifting between driving at either 150 or 0 kilometers an hour. And that driver-writer is Daniel Falconer, who is an artist at Weta and has written a bunch of their books. The blurb claims the book contains commentary from the film's artists and craftspeople, which is not true. I mean, there are a bunch of introductions and forwards by different people, but throughout the book there's no direct quotes or commentary from anyone. It's all just text written by the author, which isn't categorically a bad thing at all, but worth pointing out for the sake of redressing that unnecessary piece of dishonest advertising. Even though I have disappointments with the specifics of a lot of the text, the overall direction and concept is really good and goes a long way to carrying the text and making it overall a pretty good accompaniment to the images despite its weaknesses. Because just like the art itself, the main focus is on the design exploration and development of whatever you're looking at on that page. So there's a lot of what Weta did, how they did it, and why they did it. It's too short for any depth, so don't be expecting that, but does give really great little insights, details, and understanding into the process. Which is what the best text does in an art book, so it's not just, here's a bunch of nice art, but actually giving extra meaning of, here's the idea behind why something looks the way it does, or here's how that art was part of the film's realization. And the text really helps you appreciate the thought and attention to detail that goes into creating the stuff of the movie. The huge emphasis on the rationale and ideas behind the designs complements the curation of the images really well, which conceptually is fantastic and helps make for a solid, meaningful, and enjoyable book. 
The problem is the inconsistent quality and value of the text. There's too much useless generalized descriptions rather than specific details. Frequent statements that could be interesting but are rendered pointless due to not being followed up with examples or further explanation. So too often I was left thinking, okay, and? There's a lot of commenting on the pieces from an art theory, art appreciation type perspective. Sometimes it's genuinely interesting and insightful into the designer's decisions. Other times it's just general and obvious description of mood mood, intent, or just simply describing what you're looking at, and just too much text that seems like is fabricating fluff to fill that page's word count. Don't get me wrong, I think the 40% of the time where the text is great unquestionably outweighs the bad stuff in terms of still making the book worth it and a valuable resource for fans for the amount of genuinely interesting and insightful, specific, hard-hitting information. Its presence here enhances the images and the book as a whole, being integral to its value and enjoyment. It's just kind of disappointing and unimpressive that it doesn't all live up to that. With too much stuff that feels obviously unnecessary or so lackluster as to be unavailing, when it's clear the text could have been a lot stronger, consistent, and more discriminating in terms of making information value, quantity, and density higher. I think the best example of this is the text on the physical manufacturing of the weapons and armor. I have no idea why this is the case, but for whatever reason, almost every single instance is a perfect example of the quality and consistency I would have liked from all the text. The only problem is there's just not a whole lot of that stuff. Also, I do want to convey that 90% of the text and images are about art and design illustration, with only a minority of the content being on physical craft, sculptures, miniatures, and manufacture. So it's not like there's an even focus, just so you're aware depending on what your interests are. Likewise, you might want to keep in mind, even on the art side, the largest focus of the book is on weapons and armor. Ultimately, despite some rough edges and lamentable publishing decisions, the crafting of Narnia absolutely succeeds more than it fails in those areas that are most important to its appeal, enough to still make it one of the better film art books out there. <laughs>